Hello folks, my name is Doug Pinkham uh, with Pinkham & Associates. We are a dedicated family law firm in Orange County, California. Uh, we uh, exclusively do family law and divorce in uh, California. I am now going to do a step-by-step, line-by-line -step, uh, -line instruction on the FL100, the petition for dissolution or legal separation or nullity of marriage. Um, so, um, whether you are filling this out for a divorce, a uh, legal separation, or a nullity, this is the form that you're going to use. All right, now keep in mind I'm looking back and forth here. Some of you can actually see the form uh, while I'm going through this and some of you cannot, but I don't want you to worry about that. If you cannot see the form uh, on your screen, please download the form right now. There's a video or excuse me, there's a download button right here on this page. Uh, download the form and put the form right in front of you as we go along. You can handwrite your answers into it. If you write neatly, you can file a handwritten uh, legal document. So here we go. Um, I'm going to presume that you've paused this and everybody's put their form in front of them and everybody's ready to go. Okay, the FL100, the petition for dissolution of marriage or legal separation or nullity. Okay, we're gonna start at the top just like every other form. It's going to work like this. Uh, your name uh, is going to be go on the top. Um, it has firm name. You can also put your own name in there if you're doing your own documents. Then it asks for your address um, and the city where you live and your phone number. Off to the right, it's asking for the state and the zip code, obviously. Um, now, if you don't have a fax number, you don't have to put in a fax number, so that's okay. Um, email address is also optional. You don't have to put in an email address if you don't want to. Um, there are some counties that will ask you if you are willing to put your email address and receive notice by uh, email. Um, it's a, certainly a handy way to make sure that you don't miss anything important at court. So I would recommend that you put your email in there and agree to receive things by email if you're in one of those counties that asks for that. Okay, um, then the next line, it's asking for attorney for, so if you're representing yourself, if you're filling out your own paperwork, you put your own name in there. Obviously, it's you're the, the party. Um, then it's asking for the county, the county in which you're filing your form in. Um, whatever county you're filing that's what it goes that's the name of the county goes there then the address of the court that you're actually filing your documents in that you can google and find online that's not hard to find so look that up real quick and put that address of the court in there it asks then for the branch name the court that you are filing in uh, may very well be in a large county where there are multiple branches LA County has uh, several um, uh, North Court, East Court, South, Southwest, um, Central. So um, uh, if you're in one of those counties, make sure you put in the right branch name. Uh, then the next line is asking for petitioner. The petitioner is going to be the same name throughout your entire divorce. If you and that's whoever's filing the initial paperwork. So if you're filing the initial paperwork, you're the petitioner. If you're filing a response, then you're the respondent. But keep in mind, if you're the petitioner, you're going to always be the petitioner. And if your spouse is the respondent, they're going to always be the respondent. That's even if you file some paperwork to modify child support or spousal support 10 years from now. It's still going to be you as the petitioner and your spouse as the respondent. It never, never, never changes. <clears throat> All right, moving on. The next box uh, asks for, uh, it says petition for, and then it's giving you an option whether it's a petition for a dissolution of marriage, a divorce, or a dissolution of a domestic partnership. Then the next line down asks if it's a legal separation of a marriage. If you're filing for legal separation of a marriage, then you'll mark those two boxes. Um, if you're asking for a um, legal separation from a domestic partnership, then you'll mark legal separation and domestic partnership. If it's a, a nullity, if you're follow, uh, filing to annul your marriage, then you'll put nullity. 
I'm going to go back up and just put dissolution of marriage as that is the most common um, uh, 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 filing. So off to the right, it asks for the case number. If this, the, if this is the initial filing, you're not going to have a case number yet, so you leave that blank. Um, if you had already filed a petition and you are now filing an amended petition, then you would mark that box that says amended um, next to petition four. If it's your first filing and you're not filing an amended petition, leave that box blank. All right, moving on. The next step, it asks for the legal relationship. Um, check all that apply. So if you are married, you're going to mark married. Um, if you are domestic partners um, and our a domestic partnership was established in California, you're going to mark B. If you are domestic partners and your domestic partner was established outside the state of California, you're going to mark C. I'm going to mark A, which is we are uh, married. Again, most common filing. Uh, residence requirement. Now, what this means is to file for a divorce uh, in California, you have to have lived in California for six continuous months prior to filing for your divorce. You also have to have lived uh, continuously for three months in the county in which you file. So if you just moved from Los Angeles County to San Francisco County um, and you've only been in San Francisco for a month but you were in LA for five years before that, you have to file in LA unless you want to wait two more months until you have the residency requirement of three months in the county in which you live in. Frankly, I would suggest that you do that uh, unless there's some other reason why you have to race to the court. Now, um, just as a side note on this, there is a way to file before you are a resident in the state of California. Let's say, for example, you move to the state of California from Mississippi. If you moved here because of domestic violence, in fear of leaving somebody else, contact an attorney. There is a way to file um, certain paperwork here in California. Additionally, you can, without any residential requirement, you can move here and you lived here one day. You just moved here from Nevada or Cleveland. I don't care where you've moved from Florida or you've moved from New York City. If you've lived here for one day, you can file for legal separation. And if you put on the box where it says petition for and you mark legal separation and then you hand write in or if you type in right below those little boxes, you're going to fit it in. And if you write and in the alternative divorce or dissolution, then as your six month time starts running, once the six months is up, you can change it to a divorce and get divorced, even through that same six month waiting period. Okay, so talk to an attorney about that. Please talk to a local attorney about that. Um, that, that is a tricky way to get this done. Um, but the people that I'm talking to and the people that I'm providing this information for should be those people that have lived in the state of California for six months and lived in the county in which you're filing in for at least three months. If you have both of those standards met, there's no issue. You can file for divorce in that county. Moving on. All right. So legal separation or legal relationship we've done. Residential requirements we've started. Um, if you have lived in the county for six months, uh, if you lived in the state for six months and your county for three months, go ahead and mark petitioner's box. If you have not, but the other party has, you can use their residential, uh, residential uh, uh, um, you can use their residential requirements to uh, meet the, the burden. All right. Um, if your domestic partnership was established in California, um, you do not, again, have to be, um, have to meet the same kind of requirements, but you'll mark B. If um, you are a same sex um, and were married in California, but currently living in a jurisdiction that does not recognize California divorce uh, and will not dissolve your marriage because of that, 
Um, the petition is filed in the county where you were married. So if you got married in San Francisco but moved to a jurisdiction that will not give you a divorce from a same-sex marriage, mark C and you will file that in San Francisco County where you got married. All right then. Again, I'm just going to go back up and mark the, uh, the usual boxes. Number three, statistical facts. You're going to mark A, and you're going to put, um, well, you're likely going to mark A, and then your date of marriage, put the date that you got married, okay? Then the date of separation goes after that, off to the right. Your date of separation is that day that one of you told the other one, this marriage is over, I do not intend to continue this marriage in the future, and then you do not get back together after that. If you are separated for five years and get back together for a week, you now have a five-year longer marriage. Um, so it's the, it's the day that you tell your spouse, I'm done, it's over, and you don't get back together. The last time you broke up, in other words. That's the date that goes in date of separation. Um, now keep in mind, date of separation, there's some important information that goes along with that. The date of separation is important because the day after you separate, your income is your separate property now. It's no longer community property. If the day after you separate, you go take out a lease for $600 a month on a new car, that is your separate property debt. If you put money into your 401k or an IRA or any other kind of investment that you've earned after the date of separation, that too is separate property. Um, of course, any investments are... Uh, money that you invest during your marriage that was earned during your marriage is, is presumed to be community property. So that's the difference. That date of separation is a big deal. Okay, um, if you are not married but you have a registration of domestic partnership, then you're going to put the date that you had the registered um, date of uh, uh, the date that you registered your partnership. And then, of course, the date of separation is after that. Um, and then uh, it, it asks, by the way, for the years and months length between date of marriage or date of partnership and date of separation. So put those in the appropriate boxes there. Then on the bottom, all right, number four, it's asking for uh, the minor children of this marriage or of this union. So if there are no minor children of this unity, union, even if you have four children from a previous marriage, in this marriage, if you have no children with this spouse, it's no minor children, you'll mark A. If you do have minor children, mark B and provide the appropriate information, name, date of birth, age, and uh, gender. Then you're going to move down. Um, if there are more kids than you can put in here, um, and it will take five if you're typing them, and it'll take uh, two or three or four if you're handwriting them, even if you write small. Uh, if you need more, mark this box and then do a, um, just mark, uh, you can even use a, a single sheet of paper, regular lined paper, and at the top put attachment 4B. That's fine. You're allowed to do that. And then put the other children's information that didn't fit on this form. Um, if there is an unborn child, of this marriage, you're going to mark two there, okay? All right, so we're going to go forward as if there's only one kidder, one child. All right, um, uh, and if there are children, it's just telling you under D that you need to fill out this UCJEA form. We're, we, we have a video on that, and, and uh, it's, it's a form that's just about children. Um, that's the FL-105. You'll see another video on that, no problem. Um, and then if, if there is a voluntary declaration of paternity um, filed uh, or that was signed by uh, one party or the other, mark um, uh, that box and then put that it is attached or if you don't have it, that it's not attached, but at least mark that there was one. Okay, moving on to top of page two. Top of page two asks for, again, the name of the petitioner and the respondent. Put those in there. Again, you're not likely to have a case number because this is part of the initial filing. Um, sliding down, it asks under number five for the legal grounds of your um, action. 
So standard is divorce based on irreconcilable differences. Um, if it's a legal separation that, that you're filing, then you can have that be under irreconcilable differences, um, which is common, the most common. You can also put, uh, instead of irreconcilable differences, you can put permanent legal incapacity to make decisions. So, for example, if your spouse or if your, um, uh, yeah, under the under A, it would be spouse. So, if your spouse is no longer able medically or mentally able to make decisions for themselves, um, then you can mark that box. Um, all right, so we're going to do the standard stuff. Uh, back to divorce uh, due to irreconcilable differences. Um, B is a nullity. If you're filing, filing for an annulment, you're going to mark B. And due to incest or bigamy uh, under B. Those uh, are not your only choices, though. Uh, C allows you to nullify your marriage if the petitioner's age uh, was under majority, if they were uh, underage when... Um, you got married, um, if there's prior existing marriage uh, and, and, and somebody married you or you married somebody else when you were already married, uh, unsound mind, fraud, force, physical incapacity. I would suggest that if you are going to um, file a, uh, a for an annulment that you get some direct legal advice on how to fill out this form, at least this section. I'm sure a local attorney would be happy to answer that question for you for free. Um, it's a relatively straightforward uh, question based on the facts in your situation. So moving on, number six, uh, if you have children, you're going to want to mark, you need to mark these boxes. So A is asking for legal custody of the children. Legal custody is that, um, that right to make legal decisions on uh, health, education, welfare, those kinds of things, whether a child can get a passport uh, before they're 18, uh, whether they can join the military before they're 18, these are decisions the parents should make and they're legal custody decisions. Whether a child can marry somebody else before they're 18, they have to have parental permission to do that. That's a legal custody decision. Legal custody almost invariably is going to be ordered to be joint if you stood in front of a judge unless there's some serious problem going on between the parties or one party is in jail or abusing the children or is completely out of the picture one way or another. Otherwise, it's likely to be joint custody. Um, so that's up to you to decide whether you want to ask for sole legal custody or joint custody. Physical custody is clearly where the children live primarily. Um, if you want that with you, then mark petitioner. Child visitation. If you've marked uh, B for the petitioner, you're probably going to mark respondent uh, on C. Uh, and then it asks if you want to attach one of these other forms that, or maybe several of these forms that have to do with custody forms. Uh, I don't recommend doing that in the beginning. Um, it kind of boxes you into what you're asking for and what you're giving the other side notice for. If you don't fill out any of those boxes, they will still file this at the court and it still leaves the door wide open to ask for what you want and how you want custody and visitation to be handled later. All right. Uh, specifically how it would be handled. Hours, days, actual visitation schedule, I mean. All right, moving on to seven, child support. You don't have to do anything in this box. They're basically just warning you if you have children, there is going to be a, a child support order. And uh, if you ever stood in front of a judge... Uh, the judge is going to make child support order. Okay. Uh, eight is spousal support. Um, so, a um, couple different ways you can do this. If you are positively, absolutely going to ask for spousal support, then mark A and mark payable to you. If you're the petitioner, mark petitioner. If you're the respondent, mark the respondent. Uh, if you would like the court to terminate the court's jurisdiction to award spousal support to the other party, then mark B and um, the appropriate person that you want the court to terminate jurisdiction to award spousal support so that they can't get spousal support. This doesn't necessarily mean that's going to happen. In fact, it's quite likely not going to happen. But 
um, you can you can mark it if you choose. All right, C is a sort of an easy way out if you want to um, not set the other side off if you don't want to anger them um, and you're not exactly sure whether you're going to ask for it later or not. Uh, if you mark C and then your box, the petitioner, whatever, then what that does is it gives, it says, all right, maybe I'm not asking for it right this minute, but I want to have the uh, right to ask for it later, so I'm asking the court to maintain jurisdiction over that issue. That's what C does. Other, uh, I've used that box maybe three times in 20 years, over 20 years, so I don't know what you'd put in there. I, I specifically would not generally put anything in that box because, again, uh, this paperwork is just giving the other side notice of what you want and what you want to do. What that box will do is limit you. It'll box you into something that you've put on this paper. Don't box yourself in. Leave it open. All right, separate property. If you literally do not have a single thing that you carried into this marriage or that you acquired during the marriage by way of a gift or inheritance, and this means a gift from your own spouse, then, or, or, um, or you haven't acquired anything after you separated, all of this is highly unusual and probably not reality. So that's what A would be, though, if you have absolutely no separate property in the world. If you do have separate property, mark B. And even if you can't think of whether you have separate property or not, mark B. And then in the bottom, uh, I've got some standard language here um, that I use and that you can put in your paperwork and it will suffice. Um, you can put um, um, that property that was obtained before marriage, during marriage by way of gift or inheritance. I have an O in here that doesn't belong. Um, gift or inheritance or property that you obtained after your date of separation. Those would all be separate properties. So if you put that standard language in there, you're good. And then off to the right, you can either put to the respective party that owns that property, or you could put just to yourself, petitioner. Just put petitioner in here. All right, moving on to page three. At the top of page three, again, petitioner and respondent are named, are, are requested, put those in there. Again, you're not gonna have the case number likely. Then it asks for 10. 10 is um, uh, asks for community property. Now, so often I see people that are doing their paperwork on their own. They say, okay, we don't want to fight over property. We want to keep this simple. So I'm going to put, I'm going to mark A. There is no community property or assets. Um, that is very, very dangerous. There's an easy way to get through this, that is not the method. If you mark A, and let's say, for example, one of you has been putting some money into a, a 401k, uh, or you've been putting money into an IRA, or you bought a car during the marriage, even if it's in only one person's name, you need to understand that all of those items, if they were, they were done during the marriage, it's presumed to be community property. And it will be a problem or can very easily be a problem down the line. If you say we don't have community property and you actually did acquire property during your marriage. Uh, and by the way, when I say property, it's not just real estate. It's not land or a house or a mobile or a, or a uh, uh, you know, condominium or something. A uh, property also means the chair in your living room, the silverware in your, in your kitchen, um, the, the 401k account is personal property. The, you know, the investment account at Ameritrade, these are all, this is personal property. Uh, your motorcycle in the garage, is personal property. If you purchased or acquired anything after the date you got married and before the date you got separated, that's presumed to be community property. And if you don't specifically handle that property in this divorce, theoretically, it belongs to both of you for the rest of your lives. All right, so what I suggest is I suggest that you mark B, Determine rights, community property, quasi-community property, and assets and debts. Uh, all such assets and debts are listed, uh, and then I would mark as follows. Um, do not, I recommend, do not fill out an FL-160. 
The FL160 asks for you to name a piece of property, put the value down, then put a column in which uh, there's a column for petitioner and a column for respondent, and you'll put the value in that column. The problem is if you're not an attorney and you don't understand that form in great detail and you file it with your petition, you're telling the court you're getting all those things and you're telling the court that he's getting all or she's getting all those things for the respondent. Problem is if they're not equal, you might have a very difficult time finishing your divorce later. So I would suggest that you mark as is and then in that box put the full extent of community property assets and debts is yet to be ascertained and I will name that property and debt at a later time when it is fully ascertained. Something to that effect will get you past the filing burden and still leave the door wide open to later say there is no community property to make your judgment really easy or to name the motorcycle and say that's my motorcycle darn it or you know divide the 401k as it needs to be divided properly whatever it leaves the door wide open if you if you leave standard general language like that uh, and it doesn't box you in okay moving on to 11 uh, other requests so if you're going to ask if you think you might ask at any time for the other party to pay for your attorney's fees, you must mark this box now. Yes, probably going to anger and upset the other side. I get it. Suck it up. Deal with it. Because if you don't mark this box now and you don't put, say, the respondent because you want the respondent to pay your attorney's fees or some of them later, if you don't mark it, then you cannot ask later you would have to amend this petition later to get the judge to order attorney's fees to be paid by the other side. So let's say you're filling out your paperwork all on your own, but someday this all blows up or you don't figure it out or the divorce melts down and you need attorneys. Then you go hire an attorney and you didn't mark this box, you're going to be in trouble because the judge can't order attorney's fees if you didn't ask for it in your petition. Next box, B, petitioner's former name to be restored to. So if you have, you want to change your name back to your maiden name, you can mark B and put your name, your the name you want it restored to, to the right. Keep in mind, you do not need to do that right now. So if you don't know whether you want to do it, maybe you have children and maybe you want to keep your last name so it's the same as the kids, whatever your reasoning is. You do not have to do this now. This is one of those things where you can make this decision later. In fact, you can make that decision. And it's very easy to file a single sheet of paper even after your divorce is final. It's one of those things that is like solely your decision. Your name, even though you're sharing it with your spouse, your name is your own. And you can keep it or change it completely on uh, with your as you determine as you decide it's your name all right other again that's one of those things I don't know there's a couple other things I've put in there in a few years uh, in 20 years not very often all right then um, then we move down understand um, that this there's an important thing here it's going to say I have read the restraining orders on the back of the summons that's the FL 110 and I understand they apply to me when this petition is filed now you need to understand what that means on the back of the summons and I'm just gonna briefly tell you what they are here because you have already done your summons or you're about to fill out your summons and I explained that on the FL 110 video but on the